Right. Hey, thank you, Gabe, for my, th thank you everyone for joining this session. Uh, hope the digestion didn't kick in, right? Are we good? Huh? All right. Nice. You should bring coffee for everyone, man. All right. <laughs> All right, so uh, yeah, again, thank you for joining this session. Uh, mainly today, we're going to be talking about uh, observability using, um, in terms of service mesh capabilities and what we can do better, okay? Um, there's many things going on today with eBPF. Um, there's a bit of market confusion about things, technologies we should use for our uh, service meshes. There's multiple ones out there. So uh, things like this talk, uh, I'm, I'm taking as an example here Istio because this is what I know, um, but I think this can fit any other um, service mesh technology, right? Because monitoring is something common for every single service mesh. We all need to know what's going on in our, our cluster in between our services. Okay, so a little bit about me. My name is Adam Saya. I'm a field engineer at Solo. So basically, I just help uh, prospects and customers with all their uh, API gateways questions and service mesh. And recently, I'm getting really interested into the EPPF uh, realm. It's, it's for me a real good domain that we we should investigate into. You know, when we deal with with application networking in general. Okay, so today. We're gonna go through a quick uh, reminder about what actually why we should care about the service mesh at the first place, right? And then we're gonna take a look at, I mean, the pros uh, and the cons of kind of the actual things we do with, with service mesh in terms of monitoring. Uh, we're gonna talk about how can we improve this a bit? How can we go to this extra mile configuration optimization in that uh, matter? And um, I'm going to do a quick demo, the, though the quick demo here is not part of any product. It's just something I put together to kind of get the idea across. This may be implemented in other service meshes or should be an extension of Istio as, uh, as a, a kind of the main service mesh I know. And uh, yeah, I'm going to have a quick conclusion there and, you know, some questions, I hope. All right, so let's start from like scratch, why actually we moved to microservices. We moved to microservices because it's easy from operational complexity, we have different teams, different needs, they need different things, right? So if we have different microservices, it's easy to manage. We can always uh, upgrade easily, we can scale them differently, we can have all these fun things that comes with microservices. I remember a couple, well even just a couple years ago, uh, we used to deal with project that has like months and months in terms of life cycle, right, release. So you, we, you wait for six months to just have one security patch and then you have to do a massive upgrade and that was just a nightmare week for I used to take my PTOs around that time. So just to get out of that. So now with microservices, things are way better, okay? Uh, way better in that matter. And now every single team can just schedule their own up upgrade at their own pace. They can have they're scaling their microservices on their own terms, so it's really good in that specific thing. Now, the thing that we didn't really care about when we used to have monolith applications, if you guys remember, we used to have um, everything within the same component. So meaning, in terms of observability and knowing what's going on, it used, not to be, it used to be an easy thing. Okay, I'll plug in a debugger there inside, see what's going on, even from function calls and see even from API calls, everything was within, contained within the same thing. So no problems at all in terms of monitoring. Now, with microservices, it's a different story. Um, we are moving to, well, I don't know, I have a thousand services. How am I gonna know where, which one failed, right? There's no way out of the box to know which service failed my request, unless I'm adding some sort of metadata. If I'm lucky that my microservice is returning a result, right? And, or I just have to go through every single, I mean, my log collection or, it's a mess. So how to improve this? And actually that was kind of the main premises of what a kind of a service mesh is. Service mesh is a tool that will help us in different terms, terms in, 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 in a, in a microservice architecture for mainly these three things. Flow con uh, traffic control in general, so 
obviously resiliency, uh, rerouting, blue-green canary deployment of services and all that stuff. That's fine. Then security. Security in transit mainly. I want MTLS between every single component, every single microservice, uh, just to be safe since now that the services are scattered, I have a larger attack surface. I want to be safe there. But again, one of the main things in the service mesh is observability. So I need to observe what's happening. If something goes wrong, I always need to know to go back to see exactly what happened uh, in, you know, going back to the right service that failed, try to debug it and, you know, just having a good monitoring stack on top of all my microservices. So that's what uh, services mesh, service meshes try to answer. Now, Things are that we have multiple technologies out there, and most of them kind of face kind of the same problem, is that, well, first of all, first of all just monitoring itself is hard uh, from different things. You need to capture the right data, you need to, to capture them the right spots, you need, you know, that, just that specific concept is kind of complicated. Plus, a lot of service meshes out there uh, we'll sti we still use proxies. Proxies are a main component of a lot of service meshes, and they're important. Uh, important for all the things I talked about previously, like security, uh, like uh, traffic control, I mean, even if that we can have other tools doing it, but also in terms of monitoring. Today, we use proxies a lot in terms of monitoring. Now, the problem with that is that if my if my, like, talking about sidecars or even sidecarless, if my traffic is not going through that proxy, nothing is getting created, right? So nothing gonna get generated if there is no, um, if there's no proxy in there. And that's not the, reali reali uh, the reality of the world, right? We are not in an environment where we can just go and put sidecars and proxies everywhere. I don't think it's a good idea either. Who is going to, let's say I'm a big company and tomorrow I want to adopt service mesh. Am I just going to go and just like day and night and replace all my microservices with like a sidecar or injected traffic, uh, a, a proxy there? I don't think it's a good approach. I think we should do it gradually. Always start with like a safe application, test if everything is well, then start migrating new applications, add them to the mesh, maybe not into MTLS security now, maybe just permissive for now then add security gradually. But this also affects monitoring, meaning if you do things gradually, you're also observing gradually. And it doesn't make sense because your application, if you have A calling B, calling C, calling D, well, if A and B are in a service mesh, well, B and C are not. And meaning like tomorrow, if you're observing your stack, you're gonna see A and B, you're gonna have metrics around A and B, but nothing for C and D. And at the end, so you're half monitoring your stack, and this is something we should look into. Now, um, that's basically what I was just talking about now. Uh, we need to go gradually, and also in terms of like proxies, proxies uh, are expensive. Like we, we can debate about that all day. They are expensive because they are actually a component you add to your infrastructure. So if you add them, you need to add them for the right things. You need to add them, for example, L7 traffic are really well done using proxies. But maybe for monitoring, maybe there's something else. And maybe we should look into something different. Now, here is an example of kind of a traffic flow flying through, you know, from application to a proxy. That proxy can be a sidecar, like in a traditional sidecar approach, or it can be um, even, you know, in the sidecar less world where we have still a proxy somewhere either on the node side uh, or actually on the, on the cluster itself, it still goes in the same way. You're still going to go from the application through the kernel, socket, TCP, IP stack, going to the network, going all the way up to the proxy, again, going through the network again, and then going to the physical layer to send the traffic somewhere else. So all this is important, I mean, we still need it, but what if we can optimize this in terms of metrics? I don't want the proxy to generate my metrics until it goes all the way down through all this stuff. And actually here, we're getting a big premise saying that I'm actually 
successfully calling the proxies. Imagine if something fails even within the kernel. Like, I don't know, like, things happen, right? Like, different versions of different things, uh, just a problem with, with the infra itself. How can I know what's going on wrong with my environment? So, how can we enhance this? How can we improve on monitoring using uh, service mesh in general? So, I think the thing we should look into is eBPF, okay? That was the kind of core of this talk. How can we use eBPF to improve monitoring in the service mesh? Who here heard of eBPF? I'm pretty sure it's everyone's so hard topic, so, okay. Awesome. Who is using eBPF in some manner? Okay, so we have a good crowd here. So. Um, eBPF is a technology that is, has been implemented um, that deals directly with the kernel. I'm not going to go too much deep into this topic, uh, but I just want to stress the fact that we are not dealing, uh, we're not dealing with the same problems we used to have with like a proxy, right? Now we have something lower that deals directly with the kernel to interact with it, to watch, to report, to modify uh, data. So there is a way to interact even at the layer, uh, really, close to, really close to the kernel, and now even close to, obviously, the physical layer. Right? We're going really deep there. So how it works. This is basically the idea behind it. The idea behind it, even in Linux, you have, well, a kernel space, you have, in terms of memory separation, you have a kernel space where your actually kernel is running, it's doing its stuff, and actually Linux, or any, you know, we are, they are really strict on what things can run there, right? We don't want to run anything that is, can impact my machine on the kernel, because obviously we want the machine to run. But if the application fails, well, the application fails. It's the user's problem, not really the kernel problem. This is why there's a separation between a kernel space and the user space. And what we see usually for a pro from a proxy perspective, the proxy runs on the user space, right? It's doing, you know, obviously it's doing like uh, traffic shifting, monitoring, all that stuff. That's fine. Now, the user space, the, the kernel space, we don't interact with it traditionally, okay, in a service mesh context. And how it works, in eBPF, we can create a program, we can create some code. This code going to be verified, making sure that's not impacting anything, and then going to be running on the kernel side. It's going to listen for events, doing some reporting, doing, like, listening to things, and, you know, we can even, like, modify th stuff. But mostly in this monitoring discussion, we can monitor things in the kernel. Then there is a way to send data to the user space where we can report and generate metrics and create Prometheus stack thing, uh, Prometheus metrics and so on. Okay, so from efficiency here, in terms of monitoring, we're not talking about user space. If my proxy is not there and stuff like that, that's a different discussion. Now, we are going all the way down to the kernel to uh, observe what's happening. So this is really powerful. Meaning that, first, it can be way more effective than a traditional approach, okay? Meaning, well, we don't need a proxy. We don't need to go all the way through all this stuff. We just, we have the data there, so let's just consume it and expose it. Um, it is lightweight. It is effective. It is fast. It is not on the request path, like, I, I mean, from, from a proxy perspective. So there's a lot of things that we can use from eBPF. Now, that's how it should look like, okay? We still have our application, we still have our users, uh, user space to run our proxy to deal with L7 type things, I don't know, like retries and, oh, even the retries can be networking, but let's say, you know, security, UIDC, all this stuff that we wanna do sometimes at, at the proxy layer, but the eBPF part can run within the kernel, and there we are collecting data, and we are sending it, we are creating metrics, and from that uh, perspective, now we can observe everything going in the cluster. So with what that means, I don't know, what's the difference now that we have eBPF running the kernel, we don't need any proxy to report any metric again. Meaning, in, if, I if I'm introducing a service mesh, 
I don't have to do it gradual. Like my monitoring will not be gradual. At the first time when I install my service mesh, even if the traffic is not captured and redirected and part of the service mesh, it's still monitored end to end. This is really powerful, right? Now, I think if I have to stress only one thing during this call, during this, this talk is this thing. We should not, we should really look into EPF to monitor all our stack and we still gradually add our services to service mesh, to, to our service mesh, okay? So um, if I wanna take an example, going back to my A, B, C, D services. So I have four services running there. Even if I'm adding my, only the service A and B to my service mesh, C and Ds are also monitored. Meaning if I'm making a call to A, I'm gonna see A, B, C, D. So full monitoring over my cluster, but service mesh is partially on two services. So that's really powerful. Now, uh, again, how it works with EPF, you have, you're gonna, we, you're gonna run like a, a code on the kernel. This code will listen to different things like network, if, if, some, if A is calling B, or this is happening, report it, put it into uh, a map, we call it, right? So we put it in the map. On, on the user space, on the other side, we get this data and we do whatever we want with it. We can basically create Prometheus metric from it. And actually, this is what I'm gonna show. Um, here, I'm gonna use a, pro, like, uh, a tool that we created internally at Solo called uh, Bumblebee. Bumblebee is basically uh, a tool that help us package eBPF programs and automatically you can have the same Docker experience with a kind of an eBPF program where you can package it, push it in the registry and then run it into your cluster. But the good thing there, EBP, uh, Bumblebee also automatically create Prometheus metrics from eBPF programs. So you just have to deal with the eBPF side of it. This is just an example. I'm not saying that Bumblebee has to be used in Service Mesh or I'm just stressing that this technology, whatever I'm showing right now, can be tomorrow captured and be part of, let's say, example, Istio. Okay, so you're gonna install Istio. You're gonna have everything like either the service, you know, uh, the, the sidecar or the sidecar less version, but you're gonna have the full monitoring over your stack and actually gradually adding your services to the service mesh. So let's see how we can do that using, uh, using Bumblebee in this case. So, ah, yeah, good thing. Bumblebee is an open source solution. Actually, I can show you the repo here. We're happy to have any contribution going on too. Uh, to the tool, um, you know, check it out. It's gonna be a good entry point for, actually that's a good thing for me, for example, where I'm not coming from kind of the, the L4 network. I'm more into, you know, I know proxies, I know service mesh, but I'm learning eBPF. For me, this is a great tool because it actually helped me care about my kernel program without dealing uh, like, you know, thinking about my user space program, right? So I'll show you this in a second. So let's go back to this. Um, this first step is basically just installing Bumblebee and I'm gonna create it here. Now this is being downloaded. Then I'm gonna be a, doing a B in it, which is creating my eBPF program. I want it in C. I wanna listen to the network capabilities, okay? So actually the service mesh probably gonna be using this. File system is not really important in that context. Let's say we want a network. That just type of like, uh, I was talking about the map. You know, we use a map that sends data from the kernel space to the user space. In this case, we're gonna use, uh, well, we're gonna use a uh, hash map. And then, or you know what? I'm probably gonna just go back to re-init and create it with ring buffer. Then I'm gonna be using, let's say, I just wanna print this and then I'm gonna call it like prop C. All right, here it's created now. Let's, uh, let's just compile it. 
Mm, go back here. I'm going to go back to this eBPF program in a second. All right. So I want to show you first how an eBPF program uh, look like. So here is, you don't have to get, you, we don't have to get into too much detail. We're not here to understand like eBPF code. I'm just saying like this code, imagine that being packaged with your service mesh. So this is what gets created behind the scene for you when you install a service mesh. And if we go back to it here, if I take a look at what's happening, I can, uh, so we use something we, ca we, we call uh, k-probes that can just listen on events. And here, if what I'm doing is that I'm listening to two events when we get, uh, you know, the, the socket and exit on it. And from there, I'm triggering a function. So that's super e kind of uh, easy explanation of what we're doing here. We're listening to the network stack. If something happening, we are gathering this data, putting it in the map, and that's going to be pushed back to my user space. All right, that's it. So this one will monitor communication between A and B. Okay, every time something happens between two IPs, they get captured and put into this uh, address where it's like service uh, destination and, and um, uh, source des address and destination address. This data is going to be captured. All right. Let's build this thing. So here, there we go. We build it. This is going to be running for a second here. And should be fine. One, two. All right, so while this is compiling, when it's going to be ready, we're going to be able to use, yeah, there you go. Now that we have this program compiled, now we should, we should be able to use it. So now that this is uh, ready, we should push it to uh, a registry, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, Bumblebee allows us to create programs and push them to like a registry to be reused, like a kind of same Docker experience we can have. And then now that it's running, uh, now that's uh, built, we can actually run it. And if we run it, we're going to see that here, okay, we see data captured between two pods. And uh, every time we're going to have an IP here, it's going to be monitored and going to be incremented. This is the number of calls between this IP and the other IP. Okay. So we have this. This is awesome. Now let's think about primitive metrics. In this case, if I go back to my terminal and I make a call here to this, to the Bumblebee program, I'm going to see this automatically created metrics for you know, for the events happening between this address and the other address. And you see the count incremented here. So this was an example only for, um, that's an example here only for destination, source, uh, source address to destination address. But a lot of things can be monitored using eBPF, way more than a, pro a traditional proxy, okay? Because now we have access to the kernel, we can listen to a lot of many different things that we should never have access when we get, uh, you know, when we monitor using a, a proxy. All right, so this is done. Now let's actually build a Grafana dashboard that would use these metrics, this eBPF metrics, uh, to build uh, something. All right, it's gonna take a second here. There you go, we are starting. I'm gonna create a set of applications. So take, think about this set of applications as your app that you wanna introduce to your service mesh. And maybe you don't wanna introduce everything. Maybe you just wanna introduce the product page service. And all the other set of services gonna be not in the mesh for now. So first of all, I'm going to create my services. Now that they are created, I can uh, well, I can deploy Prometheus because I want to save these metrics, right, somewhere. This is created here, the namespace first, and then we are installing Prometheus. I'm going to take a second to, to be ready. After that, we're going to deploy the eBPF program we just created into our cluster. Think about that as 
we are installing our service mesh. So behind the scene, this is happening, okay? All right. Um, I think the network is a bit slow here. And at the end, we are going just to create, uh, install Grafana and have this graph exporter, which transform basically, will listen also to the cube services and transform that into a graph data. So here, let's deploy Bumblebee. Again, this is just an example of what we can do with eBPF. And then we're gonna use a pod monitor. A pod monitor in current, in um, Prometheus just help us uh, go reach out to certain pods, get on some address, some some uh, uh, some metrics from them, and put them in in Prometheus, right? So the pod monitor got created. Now we can generate some traffic, right? This is going through my gateway. I'm feeding I'm feeding data to Prometheus through this. So it's happening right now. I'm making calls to my application I just deployed, but behind the scene I have the eBPF program running, so it's listening to this data, it's automatically pushing that into, uh, like creating a, a Prometheus format for it, and then they have the pod monitor that gathered, grabbed this data, and put it into uh, Prometheus. And the last step, obviously, is just using uh, Grafana to show this data. So this is created, and this is fine. Now let's create this. And that's all we need to do. Now, we're gonna create Grafana. This is created. It's gonna take a second here for Grafana to get, to get ready. Uh, let's see, pod dash capital A. All right, it should be. All right, everything's running now. Let's take a look at Grafana. I'm clicking here. Just loading, first time starting, admin admin, super secure, password, skip, and then I can do something like, now. so now we have data, we have the, the eBPF data directly in Grafana, in, in Prometheus, and now we can show, like we can use it in Grafana, so I can just, let's say, create a new dashboard, and create a new one here, doesn't matter, oops, A. Uh, new dashboard. I'm gonna add a new panel here. This is fake data, but I can actually add here. I can go back to uh, go back to the main. I'm gonna add actually a data source for my graph my my, my graph data. So eBPF data uh, the eBPF data are in Prometheus, and I can use like I can I can monitor. I can create graph with it. But if you want to use a kind of a graph representation, I needed uh, kind of an exporter there that creates a structure for, for like a graph, uh, a graph service. And for that, I'm going to be using this, uh, node graph API, and then I'm going to add this address for my source. Save and test. Now we are good. Oh, actually, we don't have to have all this space. Save and test. There you go. Now let's go back to create a dashboard. New one, new dashboard, new panel. And this time I want to have, let's say, everything. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, and then if I wanna go to my, here, I'm gonna just do a node graph. And there you go. There it is. You see, now we have, well, I don't know if I can like, very smaller here, but here is a representation. I don't know if you can see, but this is going, this is kind of my microservice representation. Traffic going from my uh, service product page, which was the UI, all the way down to my other microservices. And if you can see, I have this full monitoring without even the service mesh at this point, right? I'm not installing, I didn't install Istio, I didn't install anything else. This is just part of what eBPF can do for us in that matter, in the monitoring, uh, you know, realm. Now let's go back quickly to have a conclusion here on what we should, you know, what we should care about. 
eBPF for monitoring, it's great. It has no impact on the request path, so we're not adding any proxies. This is awesome. It's lightweight. It's actually on the kernel. Uh, it runs, proxies runs in the user space. EPPF, they run on the kernel side, and they have actually, we can report data to user space, but it's kind of have a, a, a lower uh, footprint on what's happening. Uh, in the proxies, we need a proxy to have metrics, though in EPPF, we don't have, we don't need anything. We can just observe directly from the kernel. Um, the thing is, with proxy, we have a good understanding of L7 out of the box. With EPPF, we have that, which still needs kind of a, a lot of, lots of work. I have my colleague Aiden that did a great talk yesterday regarding what we can do with L7. Um, um, I, I invite you guys to, to check his talk. Now, um, things are that will eBPF replace proxies in general? And uh, personally, I don't believe that. I think we're still in the kind of the near future, this is going to be really complicated. Why? Uh, we should not think about a, a service mesh as a whole. Like we need basically all everything all together, uh, like using the same technology. Like, like I need Envoy that does all the things, or I need this program to do everything. We need to use the right tools for the right things. If monitoring means, if for the monitoring it means it's more effective and faster and better, well, you let's use eBPF. But if it's L7 where I need a better understanding of my stack, it's more dynamic, it's more complex, I need that on the user space, well, let's still use Envoy or other technology, right? So I'm just stressing the fact that tomorrow we should really think about stop, like, you know, being kind of in this which technology we should use for everything. Let's think about technologies and just use the best out of every one. Uh, I have one minute left just for the conclusion here. eBPF is super powerful, and I invite you guys to take a look at all the features we can provide with it. Okay, try to, to see if you guys want help. Uh, I mean, e Bumblebee is an open source product. You can take a look there as first start for eBPF programs. Uh, eBPF will not replace traditional capabilities of um, sidecars and proxies in the in near term. It's evolving, we'll see where it goes, but for now it's not, it's not there yet. Proxies and eBPF programs can completely run together. Uh, we showed that today we can have monitoring done by eBPF L7, all still done by our traditional proxies. With that being said, this is the end of my talk. And thank you guys for listening to me. All right. Uh, thanks, Adam, for this presentation. We have a few minutes for uh, quick uh, questions. And uh, gentlemen over there, I will bring the microphone. Uh, uh, my question is, so for this to be used comprehensively, uh, developers would have to um, uh, uh, create the applications on a specialized um, container, right? Uh, so do you mean like from implementation of the EPPF program itself? Yeah, or? yeah, because it, it seemed like the, uh, you, you had like a special con container that... Yeah, yeah, so, no, um, th well, that was because of Bumblebee, it's the tool that we use for, for that matter. Uh, things can be different, plus, actually, from a service mesh user, honestly, you should not care about this. It's, this should be embedded within the service mesh technology you're using. This code I showed you, all this mechanism that get deployed to monitor everything, that should be just part of like your install. You install that, it's running in your cluster, it has all the metrics, everything collected. So you should not really care about the EBPF program. That should be like the service mesh community working on providing this value for you. One more question. So um, when you attach the EBPF program to one of the uh, functions, what happens if I have multiple EBPF program used by different technologies? How do you coordinate that? Can, is that even possible? Uh, so, well, when you create like an EPF program, you're attaching it to an event happening on, on the kernel. Now, in terms of technologies, yeah, it doesn't really matter since like they are actually all sent to the user space using like a map. You are doing your, your kernel, your EPPF program gonna be standard. It's, there's no technologies there. It's limited, it's super guard railed. Once defined, you are going to add it to your kernel, then the data can be sent to the user space, and then you can use any technology to parse that data and transform it into something different. Okay. 
Oh, yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I see your point. I see your point. Okay, so what if I there's think, different technologies? I think you can follow up uh, oh, with yeah, yeah, Adam okay. directly right. I'll, because I'll we, need to, we need to move on to next uh, next speaker. Once again, one uh, round of applause for Adam.